They could cook me to the perfect medium rare temperature. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast. I'm your host, Jeff, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Alan. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, we are going to do the second in a, I guess, ongoing series called Out of Context, where we take a verse that you have probably heard growing up in church, bring those verses back into their their full and original context, and hopefully then give an, a new way to look at those scriptures in a way that's actually productive and not not causing you to be ridden with guilt and uh, fear that you're going to go to hell one day. Uh, so that's our goal. <laughs> uh, the verses we are going to be looking at are Revelations 3, 15 through 16. It's the old hot and cold. If you're neither hot nor cold, we'll spit you out of my mouth, but we'll get into that in a, just a sec. And then for our segment, we're going to be talking a little bit about ourselves. We're going to be, we used to have a segment called No Jamonin, which was the a combination oh, yeah. of all of our names. But since it's just Alan and I, we're just going to go... Um, Jeff, <laughs> we're, we're just going to skip the celebrity name. Let's yes, call it we uh, on the fly brainstorming right here. We're just going to call it a, a moment with Jeff and Alan. Okay. Introspective, a check-in. I don't know. We'll figure it out, but we're going to be talking a little bit about things that we have in our lives that are making our lives wonderful and useful in ways that we never thought could have happened before. Yeah. So that's, that's our show. Let's, let's get into it. Let me, let me first read this by Bi- this Bible verse that we're going to be talking about today. And I'm sure most of you have heard this in some shape or form. I know growing up myself, I heard it all the time. In fact, it was a, it became almost like a, an idiom within evangelical, my evangelical experience where you either are for God or against God. This was one of the verses that really epitomized that. So it says this, it says revelation chapter three, starting in verse 15 and then ending in 16. And I'll be reading from the common English Bible. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Alan, how have you heard those verses used in your past experience? At summer camps. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the altar call verse. Ra- rather, yeah, actually, I'm glad you said altar call because that is something I wanted to talk about. But rather than it being a cynical aside to say that some ways of using the Bible may be more incorrect or wrong. Like, I don't want to just put myself as an authority on the Bible and everything everyone else thinks is wrong. Cause there's too many, I think there's too many people who are like that and what the readers bring to the text actually really matters. Um, so there are different ways of reading the Bible and different ways of using the tradition that are more faithful and less faithful throughout time. You, you look and you see how even the writers of the Bible themselves reuse old traditions for their new times in very pragmatic ways. Um, And so I wouldn't want to say someone's wrong by taking what, what they're reading and and applying it in a certain way. I think for me, I'm still interested in like the original context of what's being said. For me, there's like a, there's like a football field worth of information, a range of possibilities when we read something. Right. Right. And um, making authors say something that they're not saying is just disingenuous to me. So, yes, we can we can apply and take texts and um, use and think about them in different ways. But like what the author was originally attempting to say is a worthy endeavor to kind of rediscover. And in this case, this verse was never read in context for me. I mean, we were a biblical church, but whenever this came up. I said, I put air quotes, biblical. Um, when, when this verse came up, it was always just, you know, you either have to be hot for God. <laughs> that sounds so bad. <laughs> or, or cold. And, it, you know, God can use you if you're cold because God can convict you. But when you're halfway, halfway emotionally available to God and halfway not, you're, you know, God will spit you out of God's mouth. You can't serve two masters. Right. Yeah. You, so lukewarm. I think the word lukewarm was used a lot. I mean, we sang songs, I don't want to be a casual Christian. How'd that go? That was exactly how it went. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to live a lukewarm life. Right? That's the one. Um, Yeah, that actually was a song. I loved that song. I used to belt it out. The funny thing is, is this is my opinion and, and where I think I'm headed is that the categories of hot and cold and lukewarm in terms of like spiritual fervor would have been... 
foreign to the ancient readers. Like they didn't think in categories of like, oh, I'm hot for God. I'm cold for God. Right. No, you're lukewarm for God. Those are kind of modern constructs. Right. And part, that's part of what happened with these verses is that we attached our emotional attachment to the words hot and cold and what they mean for us and impose them on this particular verse. And for a lot of different reasons, there's a, there's a lot here. You mentioned earlier this, this idea of a football field of information. Anytime you read a text that mentions a city, <laughs> you are opening up the floodgates for all these potential ways in which that particular text is, first of all, it's being spoken to, to a very particular group of people, a particular area. And just like any of us who grew up in a small town, we know that there's or any town, really, we know that there's the the experience that we have growing up, and we know that there's this backlog of stories that we're exposed to when we're living in a certain area for a long time, whether it's uh, a local urban myth or a local urban legend, or we know that there's certain landmarks that have significance to people who live there that have no, no significance to people that are away from there. So all that stuff, when you think of an area, has to come into the conversation, especially when we're talking about scripture. And this particular area is no different. So just for a quick context, in the beginning of Revelation, before it gets into all the stuff that Revelation is known for, it starts with very specific letters, very specific calls to local churches, seven different churches to be in fact. These are John or whoever really wrote Revelation, is writing to these churches and giving them very specific and very personal, what would you say, advice? Yeah. I want to jump in there real fast. It keeps, they're all written to the angel of the church, right? Like every single right. one. Whenever I read the New Testament, whenever it says angel, I always substitute it for messenger in my head because they mean the same thing. You interpret the Greek word angel, either messenger or angel, and too often we're like, oh, to the angel, you know, to the angel. And Revelation, I, I guess it can sustain like a divine presence sort of thing because it has lots of really rich imagery. So it's fine to say to the angel, but for me in my head, I just put messenger. So to the messenger of the church in, you know, this city, to the messenger of the church in that city, this is obviously written with the intent of being circulated. Right. So there, there's a lot of different avenues in which... You can do this. So so if, if it doesn't mean hot or cold in our particular terms in the way that we know it to mean in your studies, <laughs> in, what have you encountered in terms of what does it mean when it's talking about hot and cold? If it's not talking about religious fervor or passion or right. whatever. I think there was a really big push in the last like hundred years to try to attach historical points of interest to things that are being said here. And it, they may or may not be true. I remember sitting in Bible class uh, in my undergrad and hearing like, there's these two avenues of water that come into Laodicea via canals. Right. And one of them brings it from a hot spring. One of them brings it from this cold water source. And the problem is by the time it gets to the city, it's lukewarm. Either it's heated up or cooled down. And uh, so it's it's actually talking to something within the city. And it might be. But I think the point stands regardless. Whether the author knows about the aqueducts in Laodicea or is trying to make that connection, the the point being uh, cold water for ancient people is useful and hot water is useful, right? And the, the idea behind all of it is just you're not useful to me. That's That's the point. Not that you're like hot for God or cold against God. Hot for God is really going to bother me. I think I should stop saying that in the rest of the episode. <laughs> well, that's the subtitle of the episode. <laughs> Out of context, Hot for God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, dude. Maybe it should be. That's brutal. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the 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 thrust... <laughs> the thrust of the past. <laughs> I'm like Tobias Funke. That's my, that's my curse. This has always been... Um, the main, the main like idea behind the passage is that you're not useful to me, so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Like There's no reason for me to even be working with this community of people who say they follow Jesus, but really they're not, they're not uh, working in a useful way. And I think within context, Jeff, and you, I know you agree, it, it brings out a lot more meaning. The idea is— It absolutely does, yeah. I know your deeds. like I know what you're doing. And specifically within the within the context of this verse, he's speaking to a church that regardless of how much stock we put into the idea of two canals coming into this particular city, it's a rich city. So yes, if that water's coming in lukewarm, there these are the 
rich elite type of people that are probably not going to tolerate anything else but the good cold water, the best of the best, or the best hot water for bathing or for drinking or whatever right in the middle. And I think that's an important thing because a lot of times when we break these things down, you're going to, you know, one of the things you're always going to find is that there's some kind of either power dynamic at play behind this critique. So this is kind of a, uh, what do you call it? A judgment, whatever. Right. It's right? a judgmental. So it's calling out it. this church. And it's particular because if you continue on with the verses, it says, after all, this is verse 17, after all, you say, I'm rich and I've grown wealthy and I don't need a thing. You don't realize that you're miserable, pathetic, poor, blind, and naked. So this isn't just like the things that you're doing in usefulness. There seems to be a an underlying context of what could be useful and what couldn't be useful. Well, your wealth, um, you know, in, in verse 18, right. it says, my advice is that you buy gold from me that has been purified by fire so that you may be rich and white clothing to wear so your nakedness won't be shameful exposed. It's clearly the writer is not talking about like specific nakedness, but talking about how you've adorned yourself with your wealth, with your reputation, with whatever. Meanwhile, people around you are, right. are suffering. And we we know the city was rich because there was a um there was a natural disaster and the empire Roman empire stepped in to help out. They actually said, no, we're going to rebuild it on our own because we have enough resources. <clears throat> That's one thing that I read. Um, another, another like historical antecedent. Have you heard the, the salve for your eyes thing? Some like older commentators would say that there's this thing called Phrygian powder that they would use to like heal people's eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Aristotle makes a comment to it, but that's like hundreds and hundreds of years before this is written. Um, so I don't know how like actually connected to that it is. It might be, maybe they were known for exporting certain things. And the idea is that uh, r- regardless, there's this reversal, right? I'm rich. I don't need anything. And uh, the message of the New Testament writer is like, no, you're actually super wretched and poor. You've got it all wrong. You're looking at it backwards. Um, and to me, that is so much more powerful than telling a teenager like, hey, you either have to be really excited about God or like not excited at all. Don't be somewhere in the middle. This is more like looking at the system and saying, um, you are smug in your richness. Like your wealth has blinded you to the idea that you actually are disengaged from the work that you need to be doing. You're not useful to me at all because you're rich. So get rid of your riches <laughs> and like do the good work instead. And that's a God. I don't want to hear that as a, an American evangelical, you know, <laughs> like that doesn't sell so well to the mega churches. Like, Hey, you're super rich and hashtag blessed. Right. I'm our church is hashtag blessed because we really care about God. Do you know what this brings up for me? I, I was a youth pastor at a church in Southern California, my first church long time ago in a galaxy far away. And uh, we were handing out turkeys for Thanksgiving to local families. Our church was right next to this neighborhood that was a, a several car- apartment complexes. And so we decided we'd go to a, a parking lot and hand out these turkeys. And an elder came forward and said, this is wrong because we are sitting here handing out turkeys and not preaching the gospel. People are not getting excited about God because of the turkeys. They're just taking them to their house and feeding their family, you know? And uh, I feel like... For (laughs) shame. For shame. (laughs) I was like... And so I actually asked. I was like, so what do you suggest that we next time cart out some speakers and some mics and like preach the gospel while we're handing out turkeys to people <laughs> you should and, you should uh, stick tracks in the cavity of <laughs> the turkey and so and, and for me this text gets weaponized against things like you know the social gospel that people right. say or whatever because they say no it's 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 about being on fire for god not nec- usefulness comes later right as long as you seek first the kingdom and then you know all these things will be added to you like there's there's some elements of that that makes sense but this text is not so much like be on fire for God. This text is like be friggin' useful <laughs> and like do the good work. Um, you, you as a church are saying you, you've got it all figured out. You already are on fire, right? Like you already, you're rich. You've been blessed. You're totally in connection with God. But the truth is like, no, you're not being useful. And it's so weird that it, it takes the, the total opposite force. Well, because I think it's, it's a, it's a byproduct of what I call concordance theology. 
And I remember doing this when preparing for a sermon, preparing for something that you're teaching, you have this idea of what you want to say. And then the next thing you do is you go to the back of your Bible, <laughs> to the concordance, and you find words that apply with the idea that you already have. And then you find the couple verses, and I think this is just a victim of concordance theology, where the ethic of you're either on fire for God or not anywhere in between being of two-minded, whatever, that's clearly right. present. The ethic, theology, whatever is clearly present in evangelicalism. And this is a nice quote to go along with that, but it forsakes context. And I think it's ironic because it's coming from a place from people who use rhetoric that supposedly highly – regard scripture in its context and everything right. in there. And and you could say that that's sort of true because Paul kind of does that, right? In his in some of his requoting of the Old Testament, he has an idea and he takes words that fit really nicely from the Hebrew scriptures and kind of put them in there. Yeah, but I think call that midrash. Right. That's what he would do. And I think for us, it's not necessarily that the concordance theology thing, which I think I do have a problem with, but um we could do the same thing with an ethic that we think is very much present in the gospel, right? Like everyone does this, right? Left, liberal, conservative, evangelical, Protestant, mainline, whatever. Uh, but the, the idea here is the, the we're starting with the idea that this this verse has been connected to. And it's that that idea that you were saying earlier that discredits a social gospel, that discredits doing practical, real things to help people, that, that, that all that stuff is less important than just having – like an emotional connection. An emotional connection or an internal relationship or whatever we want to call it. And that, that very idea is probably what was a contributing factor to most of us leaving evangelicalism because mm -hmm. it proved to be uh, more exhausting than it was worth. The sad thing is, is I've, I've found myself more useful when I'm not – when I have more, more say in my faith processing, like how my faith interacts the, the world around me and how I construct it. When I'm more about the business of doing that and I'm less assured that I'm right or I'm rich or I'm hashtag blessed, but I'm actually like wrestling with God and wrestling with the Bible and wrestling with doubt, I find myself in a more useful place to connect with real people in real situations. And so uh, this passage means a lot to me just because it it does has the opposite effect of what it seems to intend. And you said this was the uh, altar call passage. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to jump in on that, but would you explain for maybe someone's listening for the first time and maybe they weren't evangelical? What was your altar call sort of experience growing up? We didn't have them in my church, but I went to your church and I, <laughs> I saw right. a few. So I, I was, uh, I, I grew up in a Pentecostal setting. So, um, the idea of an altar call was it was basically the end of whatever the sermon was. And the sermon was usually the last thing in an order of service, whether it was in youth group or whether it was in church. And the altar call, number one reason was to provide an opportunity for someone to come to the Lord. But then number two, for anyone else that was already Christian to come and respond at the front of the church to whatever message was being given. And usually the poll to get you there was the the final prayer of whatever sermon it was, sometimes applicable to what was actually said in the sermon, other times not. But it was a poll, and it was usually a, a guilt trip poll, right? Like, you don't know what's going to happen. This is the one that, ha like, I would say 80% of the time, it was something along the lines of, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You could walk out these doors and on your way home get hit by a drunk driver and not know where you stand with God. But now you have an opportunity, and it was a matter of coming down and giving your life to God. And this idea of hot or cold um, was applied specifically to the Christians in the room who may have backslidden or may have, you know, masturbated that week or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> and to come down and seek right. repentance and everything will be forgiven. So, you know, if you die on the way home, you'll be, uh, you'll be good to go. And that, that's what I mean when I say the altar call passage. Cause I honestly, I miss the altar call. Yeah. I, I loved that opportunity of reflection or some kind of spiritual exercise after you were hearing something. Um, and it's something like I there being a physical real world response, like even if it's walking 10 feet to the front of the church to right. see like some sort of give and take and some sort of like response is, is a powerful thing. I saw it done in a real, uh, a really uplifting way for me at a church in Oakland, Yvette Flender. She's the, uh, Flender. She's the, the bishop of a church, a UCC church in Oakland. And she kind of did some one, one that was kind of similar at the end of hers, but it wasn't a guilt trip. It was more like an invitation to some goodness. And uh, it was actually really powerful. 
It is. I don't think it still can be in very ways. So I, I certainly don't despair the altar call, but I'm talking about the guilt trip, the verses like yes. this that are used to pull you into some kind of unneeded repentance and, and embrace guilt and questioning more than anything else. Because you talked earlier about that idea of how you find more freedom in in the idea of being useful and not useful. I mean, how many times did we have to go back and reframe something we experienced, whether we did the right thing or the wrong thing, because we were worried about being in that like sweet spot of God's will or being hot or cold or whatever. And right. it was, it was exhausting. It was exhausting, especially as an adolescent. This passage to me is just like, do good. Right. Whether you, th- whether you think you're in the right way or not, whether you think you're hashtag blessed or not, or in God's will, don't be about that. Be about actually pragmatic goodness. And that's what matters. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about altar call, did you know that some of the early evangelical altar calls for like the big tent meetings and stuff were actually framed off of uh, fascist Germany youth events? What they would do is they would place people in the crowd strategically. So when they started doing the altar call, they would get up, not because they have this internal experience, just because they're, you know, volunteers who are there and they would start walking forward. And if you do it in such a way, you can create this massive momentum of people feeling this pull to come forward. And so like they'll come forward and kneel down. And and so like some of the, some of the means to get this emotional response are no good. (laughs) They're like, they literally come out of the fascist handbook or they're just not honest and they're manipulative. Well, they come out of they come out of the human handbook, right? They're they're manipulative, and we we can play on those things. Well, I mean, like I, I'm an emotional person, and in my relationships, like other people's emotions a lot mean a lot to me. But with my personality, there's like a fine line between manipulating someone to get them to feel better or to take care of them or like let them know they're loved and just being honest. And I think that in my faith, my emotions uh, toward God really matter. I remember in my preaching, I sh- I shared in a preaching class, my sermon with another student and we read each other's sermons. And he was like, this just doesn't speak to me. Basically the juxt, the, the, the gist of all my points were like, and this really, 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 really matters. Right. Like <laughs> I kept like adding all these adjectives that were like supposed to be super forceful and they're forceful for me, but to this other person who's not wired like me, it didn't matter as much. So I'm the kind of person that the lukewarm, hot, cold thing really speaks to from the evangelical background, because like, my feelings are the center of really who I am and the center of my relationship with God. And what I need to be told is like usefulness matters. Pragmatism matters. Like this system of rich and wealth and how it's impacting um, these people's community, community of faith really does matter. And uh, I don't want to discount anyone who has, you know, feelings of, of excitement about serving God. I think that's awesome. They come and they go. You, you gave me, a really helpful thing one time we talked about um I think it was communion and Jesus and his disciples and you said there's all these times in the in the gospels where Jesus has these amazing experiences with his disciples and then he kind of sends them out to do their own thing to really rely on their own power to figure their own stuff out and so it's like this flow of like connection and and doing your own thing and like being useful and and feeling close to God, right? Like my, my question was like, why do I feel like close to God sometimes? And why not other times? And it's something we talked about a long time ago. And I think that, that, uh, the message, whether you feel like you're totally connected to God or not, is not necessarily what matters. What matters is the work that you're setting out to do and like how it's impacting people in the real world. And that's the problem is that in, I don't know about your experience so far in more of a mainline progressive liberal church or whatever, but that question or that desire or that thought of, am I connected to God is almost non-existent. (laughs) I know. (laughs) And that's frustrating for me too, is because I, I I do think it's important to kind of have that. uh, I don't know if you want to call it a, a zealousness or a fervor for some kind of faith. And I don't even know how to describe what that looks like, but that, that emotional thing of what hot or cold initiates from an emotional standpoint is I think it's, I think it's a good thing, and I think it's missing. There's almost especially a, because the work gets hard, right? It gets and you hard. Need to ha- it does, or it gets habitual. Like it's just, mm-hmm. it almost like you've you've done it so often and so much that you it's it's void of meaning and it's void of connection with the people that you're providing that work for in the first place. That it becomes more about the work than the connection that you have 
for, to the people who are benefiting from the work. And uh, that that's that's a frustrating thing is I feel I feel like this whole journey of ours, we're just caught in the middle, <laughs> like, you know, like it's we don't want to be in that old way, but there are parts of it that we want to bring over. But those parts aren't really existent in the place that we're at now and kind of. You know, <laughs> talking you about sound lukewarm. Like, you sound like an adolescent. That's why. That's what we sound like. Is we're like, we've left this. We're in this now. We're not quite like home. You know, it, it's not just us though. There, there. Are, I, I want to say millions of people who have left evangelicalism and they're like trying to go to something different and they don't know what it looks like and they're not necessarily finding what they need in mainline traditions. So it feels like there's a becoming right now, like a weird in between space. And it's frustrating, like being working in a church, not as I mean, you're in a position in, in a position to enact more change as the the lead pastor or whatever. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm a director of discipleship or associate minister or whatever, you know, and trying to convince people, you know, because numbers are declining. People are like, well, what do we do? We want to bring people in. And there's this whole group of people that are looking for faith experience. They're looking for maybe even not necessarily actively looking, but would be open to coming into a church setting. But there's this lack of understanding because, honestly, I've heard more disparaging things to the way that evangelicals do church and that spirituality that if I was in that place, I wouldn't want to go to the church that I'm at in certain ways because it's like all the things that I love you just said are horrible and yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I feel that too. There's there's a huge ragging on evangelicalism in general that discounts all of the good experiences that people have had. Right. Right. Yeah. I felt that too. And it, it, I think it... It took us a time to get to that place where we could accept right. and, and long for those things and not reject everything. But I think that the use of this verse, this idea of hot or cold, you're either for God or against God, uh, for me, did more damage and created more um, needless struggle, internal struggle than I thought, than I think was necessary. Yep. You know what should have, you know what should have happened? Leaders should have used this exact verse, this exact like little plea to the church of Laodicea to tell you. Like, hey, it's okay to struggle with doubt. It's okay to like work through your faith and to feel maybe one way or another way because it doesn't necessarily matter how you feel. This church here, they felt great about themselves and look where they were at. Right. <laughs> like, you should just be about the business of doing the good work and like, and we're and struggling through all that on your own, you know, because God can use that. God can you and and think about it. Think about all of the instances in our tradition of these conflicted people being used by God. How many people who were satisfied and complacent and knew they were in the right like did all the good work? Like none of them, <laughs> you know. But instead, we were told that unless you're right with God, your work is worthless. Right, and that is and that's bull. That is <laughs> absolutely a hundred percent. This idea that just because you know Jesus or are closer to Jesus or love God, uh -huh. that the things you do matter more or have more power behind them. I mean, I had this whole. I mean, we could probably get into this in a whole different episode, but within <laughs> my Pentecostal circles, we didn't just have the element of I know Jesus, but we had the the extra element of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there was this like spiritual hier hierarchy where we were literally told like, yes, you can pray to God and God will hear you. But if you have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you get this expansion pack or you get this bonus or you get this whatever, Ooh, expansion then expansion pack. Exactly, right? Use it. I've been playing a lot of Zelda lately. So <laughs> uh so you you kind of have this extra if you have the the infilling of the Holy Spirit and you're kind of like on this other level. And the same thing is true. It's like the things you do matter, but they matter a little bit more when you get a power up from your salvation and a little bit more when you get a power up from your <laughs> infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that was a really crappy place to be in when you were when you were earnestly genuinely trying to figure out the right way to live the right way to be a follower of god man it's so it's weird how how my brain is like recontextualizing all this stuff right that stuff goes deep it really does i feel like this verse is saying uh, like Jesus hears someone say the word Jesus and it's like, get my name out of your mouth. <laughs> like, I don't <laughs> care. Like, I'm going to spit you out. Like, I don't care if you're going to attach my name to your blessings or whatever. That's not, that's not what this is about. You know, it's something different. It's, it's about the work that you're doing and not this. So this, this should speak very powerfully to the evangelical churches that think they're on fire for God and are building these massive monuments to capitalism. This should speak directly to them. 
Right. And they should should hear Jesus saying, get your, get my goddamn name out of your mouth. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's a work. (laughs) Because the imagery in that second part of the verse is pretty violent. Like it's not, it is not spit you. It's vomit you out of, out of my mouth. And I think you have a good indication on where you are personally is when you think about God, like violently spitting someone out, who's the person you picture. And for me, I picture Franklin Graham, Falwell Jr. (laughs) and Trump. (laughs) You know, that idea of this is what's despicable. Despicable to God, like because that's a powerful image of like something so awful that you have to like. And it's not just that you're on the opposite side of a political spectrum from the people you named. It's also because they are the wealthy. They're the ones that have internalized this message that that's being spoken of, and especially verse seventeen. Yeah, exactly. I I also want to say just to add one last thing: there actually is an exchange, right? There's supposed to be an exchange in these verses. I counsel you to buy from me and that buying requires spending <laughs> like you're rich. You have acquired wealth now buy from me, you know, like there's, and, and that I've never heard one sermon preached on that. I've never heard one person say, Hey, this is about the the wealth, the wealthy redistributing and taking care of those who are needy. Like I've never heard that before. And that's that's the thrust of this passage is like trade in your hashtag blessed wealth for the good stuff that I have to offer. You know, it's always been about individual salvation. <laughs> Buy from me clothes to wear and, you know, salve for your eyes. And and I think it's important to note that this section, the context of this particular verse ends with another common verse that you probably all heard starting in verse 20, where it says, look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and be with them and we'll have dinner with them and they will have dinner with me. So this, this literary contrast of spitting something out of your mouth into dinner, a meal. Uh, I think that there's some the things happen literally that are very beautiful. This, this idea of redemption, this idea of your, your wealth doesn't have to define you, your, who you have and the things that are going on internally don't have to define you, but you can choose to define yourself by the things that you do, the way that you treat people, the way that you bring about justice in your world. And it is as if you are having communion with God. It is you're having communion with God. You're having communion with others. There's an inviting aspect to this that is completely missed when we just concentrate on this idea of hot or cold, good or bad. And, and narrow everything down to this this binary because at a meal there are no binaries right like <laughs> it's all that kind of stuff is just laid out and you have connection in so many different places right I I love that the the concept of the alpha and the omega and revelation this person who's the first and the last saying um, these hard things to these rich people but then saying I love the people that I rebuke right those whom I love I rebuke and I discipline so be earnest and repent there's this call to repentance. Come in and eat with me. And the 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 idea is, and this is something I found to be true, and it's hard to get preachy, not to get preachy. The goodness of the work of Christ far outweighs the things that I have comforted myself with in my life. Like those times where I've sat at table with God and with other people are the most powerful things and the most worthy things of my time and my effort that I've discovered. And that's what this that that's what this is saying. So I, I love that call to that. Right. And Super I love that good. too. Like when you're, you're talking about that idea of those are the moments. When I think back to my whole time as a youth minister in evangelical churches, and I think of, I think of, uh, this, this idea, this misnomer of hot and cold being like an emotional response. And I think I correlate that in my mind. I have this image of like the service, the message, the church setting. But then this ending part, every, Every youth service I had, we always, at the the end of our little thing, we announced, we're going out to this restaurant. We rotated. We went to a fast food restaurant or whatever. And I remember way more moments that happened in that those restaurants after than I ever did in any of the services. And I think that that, that image of it, – it, it's weird. Like I'm having kind of weird like <laughs> – weird like flashbacks. And again, like you said, recontextualizing my past when I see that that idea of how this so relates to – all the effort in evangelicalism that I put into the service, the idea of whether you're right or wrong with God, and not enough service into that last part about having meal and inviting and connecting. And uh, mm-hmm. wow, man, might tear up here a little bit. <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's they're so powerful to have have those images of um, of connection as opposed to division. 
Taco Tuesday is a very spiritual thing. It is. Very powerful thing. Magical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So any, any other final thoughts on this particular passage or the, the, the negative or positive things that have come out with, out from it? Um, I would say I, I'm all, I'm all about how we use the Bible. Use it how you want. Take what you will. Um, but just recognize that this is written to rich people who are disconnected from the work of God because they think they are blessed. And there's a call to repentance for that. And then, um, take comfort in the fact that, uh, you may, feel good or bad as someone who's doing faith as a person of faith, um, or faithful or not. But in the end, like God uses all kinds of people, all kinds. And it's more about being available than it is about being right or wrong, hot or cold. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I would say prioritize usefulness over liturgy in the sense that prioritize what yeah. really matters and how people really connect. That doesn't mean you can't use a traditional form or a traditional mechanism to project that youthful youth usefulism, usefulism <laughs> to, to project that idea of being useful or making it a real impact in whatever it is that you're doing. But sometimes you can't. And if you prioritize the usefulness over the idea of this is how it has to be, or this is this is the ways in which we experience God or experience spirituality, the, the usefulness of it matters. If we're doing something out of just pure liturgical reasons, and when I say that, I mean like this expression of something that's going on internally, uh, I think that there has to be a marrying of those two things. And I think that overall, Scripture teaches that again and again and again and again is... We're not just burning the thing down to burn it down. We're burning it down because it's perhaps lost its usefulness. And it's, it's not just about being re relevant. That's not what you're saying. Right. It's, it's like th there is no there is no way of doing faith other than faith in real time. You know, like as things are happening around you, as it's important. That's how it's always been from the very beginning. Every single person you're reading, every single person that came before you, it's exactly what they did. And, and we're no different. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a commentary of sorts of what's already happening. And that's where our focus should be. Well, let us know what you think uh, about this particular episode or even this ongoing series. We have when we met together for this particular episode, we came up with a list of like 20 different verses that we want to do in this whole <laughs> out of context uh, series that we started back in episode 103 with uh, Philippians. Uh, so we'll put that in the show notes if you want to see our past episodes on uh, talking about scripture and then our past episode in this particular this particular series, I guess we'll call it. So if you'd like to add your voice to this particular conversation, you can comment at the show notes at arenacast.com slash 111, 111. Also on the show notes, you'll find relevant links and a complete list of all the other ways you can like, follow, or contact the show. That's arenacast.com slash 111, 111. Uh, on the other side of the music, we'll be expanding our conversation of the useful into <laughs> some practical things that are affecting our daily lives on a real and regular basis. Well, as we said at the top of the show, we don't have a name for this particular segment, but we thought it would be uh, just a good idea to, to – I don't know if you've noticed lately, but we've been trying to connect more our segment with our conversation, at least even if it's just a thin thread of connection. But we figure since we're talking about a scripture that highlights usefulness and, and doing good work, we thought it would be great to kind of just share our lives a little bit with you and f talk about something in our lives that is that has come into our lives that is that is useful that has been more useful to us than we might have expected and how perhaps we're at a place now where we can't live without this particular useful thing and the something that we found useless right well i have one uh yeah i can go that route too there's a lot of uh, <laughs> something something you're going to spit out of your mouth things not people right <laughs> 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 Jeff, people have problems. People aren't problems, Jeff. <laughs> I mostly, you know I mostly I believe that, my, that. I heard that in my counseling class in seminary, and I was like, 
I know that's, I was like, Hey, I think that's true. But what about everything I was taught <laughs> in church? <laughs> like people are the problem. <laughs> people are the problem. They're depraved. Uh, they're sinful. Yes. And I'm not kidding. Like useless. It was a crisis. God. Yeah. It was a crisis of faith for me being like, people aren't the problem. People have problems. I was like, that goes against everything I was taught about original sin and repentance and everything else. It was just so, so weird. Um, anyway. Okay. So something useless or something useful. Jeff, do you want to go first for your uh, something that you find extremely useful in yes, your life? Yes, I do. I It's going to be something in your kitchen. It is going to be something in my kitchen, <laughs> 100%. I have, if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know that I, I fancy myself a home cook, and I like to cook delicious meals for my family and for myself, and I discovered a tool probably about six months to a year ago, maybe a little bit longer, but it is... The single greatest thing outside of my wife, kids, family, friends, outside of people. <laughs> so thing. I'm, I'm differentiating this between. You know what? We people. might be saying the same thing. So why don't we say it at the same time? Like we didn't plan this, but I think I think we're on the same wavelength. You think we are? Yes. Because we I, are. I'll I did be too. Highly Mine's impressed. in my kitchen right now. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to say it. <laughs> we're going to count to three. On three. One. What? Two, two, three, three. Sous vide. Instant pot. Okay, Aww. no. <laughs> Different. <laughs> Similar though. I'm I'm on my way to getting an instant pot because I have a really? uh, I have a stove top pressure cooker and pressure it scares cooker. me. Uh, yeah, I've heard they're scary. Mine's fantastic. You just set the. That was one of my in, my things. I won't get into it because it's gonna make me cry how great it is. But I make lentils and rice and beans in 15 minutes, man. Stuff like that. You just set it and walk away. An Instant Pot Wonderful. is on my list because essentially it's an electric uh, pressure cooker. And I have a stovetop version and, and I'm scared to use it. I made pho <laughs> once and it turned out amazing, but I was scared. You should like, send me that. I would love pho. Uh, it's really good. I got, what if there's a vegan version? Anyway, so tell me, tell us about your sous vide. Okay, so sous vide. It's, it means, it's French. It means like in a, cook in a vacuum or something like that. Of course, it's but, French. Yeah, I know, but it's okay. It's well, I'll let it slide this time. Because um, <laughs> yeah, of cooking, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, so, what this is, if you haven't seen this, uh, there's a, a famous one called the Jewel. This website called Chef Steps. Um, but essentially, what it does is it regulates water temperature. So you, it's like a cylinder, and you put it into a pot or a container of water, and then you set the temperature, and it keeps it at that temperature consistently, no variance. So this probably would apply more for me than you, Alan, since you don't eat a lot of or any meat. Um, but if you cook protein and you love meat or eggs or anything like that, or hard vegetables like carrots or potatoes, you put your food in like a bag and you dip the bag into the regulated temperature water. It's basically an immersion circulator and it cooks your meat to the perfect temperature. So when I cook a steak, I like medium rare, like perfect medium rare i can dictate the temperature and it cooks perfectly every time and the beauty about it is is that if i'm cooking a steak on the stovetop i have the short window of doneness right like it can get overdone or underdone really quickly and when you have two twin four-year-olds running around the house and you're trying to cook dinner to to have enough free time to get the food right in this small precise window is almost impossible but i can put that steak in the sous vide like for two or three hours and any time in that window, it's going to be ready to just sear on both sides and ready to serve. It's perfect every time. I do my eggs, perfect poached eggs, not like runny, but not hard, just like almost like a creamy consistency for the yolk to put on top of some toast or um, some sausage or some grilled vegetables. And a poached egg with a delicious yolk with wonderful consistency is the perfect topper to any dish. Asian noodles, anything. It's just the perfect it's a perfect thing. So my sous vide is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. The greatest thing that's ever happened to me is a sous vide because it's perfect. It's wonderful. <laughs> this sounds like a father of toddlers who can control one thing in his life. <laughs> I, I'm in all about control. Area, in this one little <laughs> so area. This particular, and it makes I can so, get it exactly. Such good food. Such good food. I've done a Thanksgiving turkey in it. It's perfect. I've done... Uh, a, a Christmas prime it, rib roast on it. It's perfect every time. Can you put it in your bathtub and get like the perfect? <laughs> if you got a couple of them, yeah. I think it's like 19 <laughs> gallons that I can regulate at one time. But yeah, you can set it up like that, like a nice jacuzzi. Uh, Maybe I'll just have a bunch of sous vide flo floating around me, like heating my water up. You should. Maybe, Maybe be safe. 
It could cook me to the perfect medium rare temperature. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful. If, if if you're out there and you have a sous vide, you know what I'm talking about. You're you're throwing your fist in the air. You're saying yes to everything. If you haven't experienced it and you're thinking, wait, I'm not going to put something in water, just trust me. Go to – if you want to see it done to perfection, go to the YouTube channel Chef Steps and watch all their sous vide videos. And you will immediately want to go out and get one. And it's it's wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. I can't imagine what life was like before it. Mine is a little less romantic, I think. Mine was more uh, sexual than romantic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I mentioned this, man. I, I must have. And I want to say in 2015. We were recording in 2015. It seems like forever ago. And I know I mentioned it in some episode. But my favorite thing, most useful thing in the world is the water pick that I have in my bathroom. I have a vague uh, recollection I of you hate, mentioning this. <laughs> I hate flossing with a righteous vengeance. It's the worst thing in the world. Feeling like strips of string breaking between your teeth is like the grossest. I just, I don't know. I hate it. Okay, I'm going to get super personal here for a second. I was diagnosed with a disease by my dentist a couple years ago. They were like, you have periodontal disease. Your The bone is receding from your teeth because you're getting old. And, you know, you're probably drinking too much soda and stuff. This was years ago. And there's little gaps between, like, between the teeth and gums, so little pockets, where they have to do this really painful, like, procedure to clean it out and, like, all this stuff. And I remember sitting in my car after the dentist appointment being like, my whole life has changed. I'm diseased. I'm awful. <laughs> like you have no, you have no idea. Like it really hit me. I think I was 20. God, I can't remember 25 or six. I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to take care of my teeth really well for a year and see what happens. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, there's no way you could like refix something like that. Well, I kid you not for one year, I used a water pick almost every day. Um, I use like mouthwash and brush my teeth, went back to the dentist and they're like, you have the greatest teeth we've ever seen in our entire life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I have a savior and its name is water pick. And, uh, it not only cleanses and heals me, but you know, gives me what I need. And I love, so water pick shoots water out of this little tiny stream and you just shoot it into your teeth and you start on a low setting. Cause the pressure is really weird at first, but eventually you can get it up higher. And it's way more effective than flossing. And so I love the feeling at night just using the water pick on all my teeth and then using the leftover water to, like, clean my sink with a little water pressure. <laughs> this, like, feeling of of enjoyment when you see, like, you know, buildup of soap or something just disappearing underneath a little water pressure is the greatest feeling in the world. It, it feels like you're ready to go to bed at that point, you know? Like, everything is right in the world. Um so that's my most useful thing. Uh, my my least useful thing, and I, I do want to talk about this because it really makes me upset. I went hiking with my older brother up to Lake Catherine in uh, New Mexico a year or two ago for Alan's Big Adventure. I'm going to put that in the show notes because I loved that on my Facebook. Hashtag Alan's Big Adventure. I took pictures. I went to all these national parks, spent two weeks driving around, and I bought these camping this camping equipment that was supposed to be a thing you can heat water up in and two little cups where you can make your coffee and drink your coffee. And they're made of plastic and they melted when I poured hot water in them. <laughs> so they're plastic cups for hot water that come inside of a steel container for coffee that melt by far the most useless thing I've ever bought in my entire life. My older brother was just like, Oh, it's still good. It still holds. And so he was just drinking his like with partially melted plastic and i maybe i'm too much of a hipster but i was just thinking about xenoestrogens and you know corporations <laughs> poisoning my body and stuff and so that's the most the least useful thing that i own are melting camping cups for coffee i so in terms of uselessness i i can't think of anything recently i feel like i do a pretty good job of not allowing useless things into my life in the first place <laughs> uh <laughs> I really have no tolerance for uselessness. Because I know you, that's like, oh my god. It's true though, that's right? So like that's that's not hyperbole. I'm, that, I'm, that people thing was not a joke at the beginning. That was not a joke whatsoever. <laughs> no, it, unfortunately, it wasn't. I guess I'm working on that. Uh, so, so for me, two things that I think of when I think of useless things in my life that I have purged from my purview. Number one. And I know many people, you, you might be listening, this might be the death nail in terms of you ever listening to us again. But number one, I think the most useless thing is a Keurig. 
Yeah. I'm putting quotes in the air. Coffee makers, which if you if you're drinking, Kira, you don't like coffee really. You just don't. Um, forgive me. I'm a coffee snob. I'm 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 a coffee snob of Lydiosia. I'm neither hot nor cold. I'm lukewarm. I'm comfortable in my snobbery. Um, but they are wasteful. They make a crappy cup of coffee. And the minute I learned how to do real coffee, pour over French press, espresso, AeroPress. If you don't know what these things are, look them up. I'll put them in the show notes. Embrace them. Love them. Bring them into your life with full passion. And hotness. <laughs> uh, Jesus is cracking in a corner being like, I wish Jeff felt like that about me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely is. Uh, I, get, I get a little too passionate about this stuff, but it it was it was useless. We got it because we thought it would be convenient and nice, but it, it was, we got rid of it as soon as we. So the, the maker of Keurig said that he really regrets making it. Did you really? See that? I did not know that. Big old announcement. It was in the news. He's like, I regret making something that is a scourge on humankind. And the environment. How many? T- how- That's what he's talking oh, about. Yeah. yeah. No, he's not saying because it's crappy coffee, Jeff. <laughs> he's saying it's because of the environment. He really regrets doing it. And then, God, I can't remember why, but a bunch of um, 52 supporters. He's 52, right? I wasn't going to say his name, but our commander in chief. So a bunch of Trump supporters were destroying Keurigs. Did you see that? I did, but that was for what was it about? They were throwing it off balconies because it was like... one of uh, it was one of the sponsors that pulled away from Sean Hannity on oh. Fox News for something that he said, and then a bunch of people said, "Well, we're not going to support this company." Which you know, I, I guess at least they end up they ended up doing something good. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> By getting rid of their Keurig. <laughs> uh, so again, apologies to those of you out there. But you know what the cool just, thing about capitalism is? You What's can that? feel like you're in control a little bit from time to time, even though it's a total illusion. Total illusion. <laughs> Sometimes illusions are healthy and nice, and they're like a warm blanket that keep us a little bit cozy. Uh, so the other thing, I guess, that would be useless, I, I know I mentioned too, but something I purged from my life a long time ago, which I'm not as passionate about, but I just think a wallet in general is a useless thing. Yeah. Um, I followed you in that too. Yeah. Totally. My so phone got, holds my cards. Yep. I got rid of my wallet and I have my license and my debit card in a little pocket on the back of my phone and I haven't looked back. And now I don't even need that most of the time because I can use Apple Pay or something like that. So yeah, I'll be looking forward to the day where I don't need car keys and I don't need a wallet because it's all on my phone or not even my phone. I can do that on my, my, my watch also, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. My, my nephew just recently asked, he's like, Hey, Uncle Alan, uh, do you have any change? And I told him no. And he said, can I see? And I was like, <laughs> what the heck? How do I show you something that I don't have? He's like, well, cause he didn't believe me or whatever. And he's like, just in your wallet, in your wallet, in the change area. And so I had to take out my phone and show him. No, you know, I, I have cards and the change area of a wallet. I forgot about that. It right. only worked if you had a Velcro wallet. Otherwise, it would just spill out all over what the about, place. What about those little plastic picture holders that you would like slide in and have all of your favorite pictures of people and flip through them? Does that I seem that, so... Dude. I don't. I saw someone the other day pull out their wallet and their their, their <laughs> pictures were like that thick. And, right. and they're, they ha- they're holding their wallet and their cell phone in the same hand. And I'm like, why do you have all those pictures? That makes no sense. You're just carrying that around on, on, on your ass cheek and like making right. things uncomfortable everywhere you go. My older brother used to have like a seriously, I want to say like a foot thick wallet and he'd put it in his back pocket and he'd like sit sideways every single time he sat down. And I'm like, there's no way that's good for you. You know what? You should get a cancer causing cell phone and put it in your front pocket near some area. Never mind. I feel passionately <laughs> about that too. So the second we can get rid of these radiation machines, I'm turning into a. I'm going to be a hippie, Jeff. You are. Old. You're well on gonna, your way. I'm going to move to one of those cities where there's no electromagnetic noise or whatever and like grow bean sprouts and mason jars. The only thing you're missing is occasional showers and dreadlocks. <laughs> occasional showers. <laughs> I could probably. <laughs> I've always wanted dreadlocks, dude. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. <laughs> and as much as you go to the gym, I do not recommend occasional showers. <clears throat> yeah, for dang sure. All right. Well, <laughs> I think that'll do it for us this week on that note. So, uh, Alan, how can people find what you have going on on the interwebs? I say it every single week, but seriously, go on Facebook, follow me. Um, you can add me as a friend. I may not add you back. I don't really add people that often, but if you request it, you'll follow my stuff. And I usually post my writing 
Um, I'm writing on three or four different blogs that are kind of disconnected. I think this upcoming month for my intersections group, that's a group that does basically what Jeff and I do on the podcast, but with a bunch of people talking about their experiences of leaving evangelicalism, what they found to be life giving, like where they're at processing faith together in a really cool and open and confidential space. We're actually going to have Jeff and Adam, a co-host of Divine Cinema, which Jeff will mention in a second. They're going to visit intersections and come and, and see what it's all about and hopefully record some of my colleagues, my coworkers who helped me in that, in that sphere. So an episode will be coming out about intersections pretty soon. And there'll be six of us discussing well, what we're doing and it's super cool. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So look for that in the next probably couple of months, we're going to do like a round table style to talk about that particular mode um, of kind of doing what we do. Like, like Alan said, doing what we do on the podcast and, and inspiring others to do that in, in real life. Connecting. Also, uh, this is something I don't share on Facebook, but I started a blog called Mud Before Blood. <laughs> it's a WordPress, bro- WordPress blog. Mud Before Blood because I would eat animals to survive. I just want to say I'm not, uh, what do you call that? A radical or a whatever. I'm not a radical. A fundamentalist. I'm not a fundamentalist. I would eat an animal to survive, but I'm vegan because I can be. Because it's possible. Because the only thing between me and veganism is like my taste buds. That's it. So that so that's why I've chosen to become a vegan. It's been one whole month, Jeff. I get to tell you that. Like the, one whole month, I was a vegetarian for two years. Now I'm vegan, and I'm going to the gym every single day. And I'm actually writing a blog, writing to a blog about it. So if you want to find that, look for Mud Before Blood. Sounds good. And uh, you can follow me on all the socials at Jeff Manildi. And on the second and fourth Thursday of every month, my other podcast is called Divine Cinema, which I co-host with Adam and my other friend Dylan. And we talk about movies that have faith themes. And we we either tear them apart or praise them, depending upon how good or bad that they are. And uh, that, that podcast actually started from this podcast. It was a spinoff of some episodes that we did before our, our more, most recent hiatus. So if you want to check that out, that's at divinecinema.net. And yeah, so as for Ironicast, if you enjoy what we do here, uh, please recommend us to a friend or leave a rating and review for us on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to. We would really appreciate it. Or you can take your support of the show to the next level. Consider going to Ironicast.com slash Amazon before you make your next purchase and then just shop as usual. By using that link, we'll receive a small percentage of your purchase without any extra cost to you. That'll help us a little in covering some of the the costs associated with running the podcast. That's Ironicast.com slash Amazon. Amazon. Uh, So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Alan. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go be useful. Sorry, that sounded weird. Go be useful. Go. <laughs> <laughs> go be useful. Woohoo! Oh, there you go. There you go. That's, That's the one.